On March 30th, 1972, massed North Vietnamese Army artillery opened up in a shattering barrage. The targets for the guns and rockets were South Vietnamese positions across the demilitarized zone, separating North and South. As the guns blasted South Vietnamese defenses, upwards of 20,000 of Jap's troops and 200 of his 600 tanks waited in their jumping off positions. At noon, they surged forward as the South Vietnamese units fled in panic. Facing the northern onslaught was a weak South Vietnamese infantry division and a marine brigade. Their 12,000 troops were scattered across 13 combat bases and outposts. The enemy assault caught the infantry division just as it was moving regiments from one position to another. The southern defense was thrown into complete chaos. Intelligence reports had predicted a northern attack, but no one had expected it to come on the demilitarized zone. After two days of confused fighting, on April 2nd, the South Vietnamese began to retreat to a new defensive line. The northern offensive across the demilitarized zone had forced the South Vietnamese to fall back to Route 9 and the Qua Viet River. To the west, the line was held by Camp Carroll, the Rock Pile, and the Mai Lok Combat Base. In two days, these bases fell and the NVA pushed to within 10 miles of Quang Tri City. Further south, the city of Hue was threatened from two directions. Facing the NVA were the South Vietnamese 1st Division and a division of Marines. The attack opened on April 1st, 1972. To the west, the 324B Division pushed southern forces back in heavy fighting. For a time, the defenders held a line from the Mai Chan River to Firebase Bastonia, an old American outpost. But soon, even that line was being pushed back. The North Vietnamese attack on Quang Tri City and the push towards Hue were furious assaults. But on April 9th, after a few days of fighting, the NVA were forced to halt their attacks and resupply. Outside Quang Tri, the North's failure to keep up the pressure saved the South Vietnamese defense from complete collapse. One tragedy of the situation is that not only are the civilians abandoning their homes, but the army is abandoning its bases. The South Vietnamese are not the only ones in retreat. This was an American advisory compound. But faced with constant enemy artillery bombardment, the Americans are pulling out. The 
Americans have set fire to their base camp, are draining the water tower and shooting holes in the tires of their vehicles. About a hundred Americans who abandoned this outpost just opposite the badly damaged Quantry airfield will join about 200 more U.S. soldiers south of Quantry City, just out of range of enemy artillery, at least for the time being. The South Vietnamese are locked in a head-on clash for supremacy over the area just south of the DMZ. The fate of South Vietnam's northern province seems to rest on the shoulders of soldiers like these and could also seem to be the hopes of the American policy of Vietnamization. Will they turn around, halt the enemy, or will they keep running? Jim Laurie reporting for NBC News. The South Vietnamese military command says that less than 300 Saigon troops have been wounded in the fighting in Quang Tri province. That appears to be a very conservative figure. According to field reports, the South Vietnamese Army hospitals in Quang Tri City and nearby Hue are so full that some of the wounded had to be evacuated to the U.S. Army Hospital in Da Nang, 100 miles away. These soldiers are from the South Vietnamese 3rd Division, a new unit whose job it was to defend against an enemy attack across the DMZ. The North Vietnamese drive into Quang Tri was the 3rd Division's first test in battle. So far, they haven't done very well. If the North Vietnamese attack had taken place last year at this time, many of these wounded might have been Americans. But now, the Americans, except for a few advisors, are gone. And this is the result of Vietnamization. Arthur Lord, NBC News, reporting. The French used to call this highway the street without joy. Somewhere between 10 and 20,000 people are fleeing southward down the highway to escape the North Vietnamese advance. It's nearly 20 miles from here to the DMZ, and some of these people have walked almost that far. Behind them, they've left the towns of Zhou Lin, Cam Lo, and Dong Ha, and rate them a path of a North Vietnamese drive to cut off the northernmost province of South Vietnam. Nobody, Vietnamese or American alike, has seen such a civilian evacuation since Tet of 1968. The refugees are seeking the safety of Quang Tri City, 
where there is no safety. The North Vietnamese are right behind and bombarding the route to Pont Tree hourly with rockets and mortars. For the first few days of the northern offensive, poor weather had prevented full-scale intervention by American aircraft. However, as the skies cleared, U.S. fighter bombers and helicopter gunships began pounding NVA positions. They were joined by massive air reinforcements rushed to the region, including B-52s and four more aircraft carriers. Hundred seventy five millimeter guns pointed their barrels to Fang Tree City and opened fire. 
what appears to be the definitive South Vietnamese drive to reoccupy the ruined capital of this country's northernmost province is underway. The smoke over Quang Tri's central fortress, the Citadel, was caused by airstrikes and artillery. The border by tank, South Vietnamese Marines, entered the Citadel in front of us. We could hear the fighting, even if we could not see it. Marines stand before us and accompany the operation. South Vietnamese forces have taken severe casualties in the few months of fighting, very quickly, which is now a terrible thing. The Marines apparently want to avoid publicizing the losses they have seen the most of the nation to fight the central plan. Yeah. Đi, con bắn nó bị chín quá đi cái con cái tôi dưới
Thôi đi đâu đi đâu đi More than 500,000 just three years earlier. Under the Nixon administration's Vietnamization plan, most remaining U.S. troops were acting as advisors to the South Vietnamese Army and Marines, who were now doing most of the fighting. From the North Vietnamese perspective, the time was now right to long topple the government of South Vietnam and destroy its forces. So on March 30th, 1972, the North Vietnamese launched a massive attack against South Vietnam. The idea is to, to just exert enough pressure on the... Although they had indications that the North Vietnamese had been building up, the timing and location of the thrusts caught the Americans and the South Vietnamese by surprise. One of the main thrusts of the invasion penetrated Quang Tri province, just south of the demilitarized zone. They came with massive amounts of infantry troops. When the North Vietnamese attack began, we ran for a big bunker. We were at the I-2 combat base about 10 miles south of the DMZ. Hey, Turley immediately began monitoring radio reports from South Vietnamese fire bases that were strung out along the 15 miles of the DMZ. Within the first 12 hours, two of those bases fell. It just simply blew them away. The main thrust of the North Vietnamese attack developed down Route 1 toward the town of Dong Ha, just north of Quang Tri City. We could see, actually, flashes of artillery. That got orders to move north. We got as far as Dong Ha. While waiting for orders, Ripley heard from Colonel Turley at I-2 Firebase that for the first time in the war, the North Vietnamese were using tanks. Tanks that were heading straight for Ripley's position. In Dong Ha, covering the North Vietnamese invasion, was 30-year-old CBS News correspondent Bob Simon. High-ranking American officers say this will be the big test for the South Vietnamese Army. But thousands of South Vietnamese civilians have decided not to wait for the results. As the civilians fled Dong Ha, North Vietnamese guns began ranging the city. It was uh, the most incredible thing I'd ever seen. They were systematically destroying the city to prepare for their advance with infantry and their tanks. The only thing standing between the invading North Vietnamese forces and the city of Dong Ha was a bridge over the Cam Lo Qua Viet River. I uh, told Blick. Roger, uh, let me know soonest. Ripley enlisted the help of a reluctant South Vietnamese tank commander to lend him two tanks. We traveled roughly a mile from that location up to the bridge. It was one of the most amazing rides I've ever been on in my life. Artillery hitting on both sides. The road cluttered with dead refugees, bundles of goods and clothing, blown up vehicles, ox carts all sorts of livestock dead. Ripley crawled out under the bridge into the channel dangling between the I-beams. I had to position these explosives in each channel, time consuming because I had to position them, come around, swing over to the next channel, come. Because it took so long, Ripley was convinced he would be killed trying to blow the bridge. Miraculously, Ripley managed to place the explosives, set the detonators, and run for cover unscathed. And the bridge blew up. I didn't see it coming. I didn't have any idea of when, but it, it was such a huge explosion that just blew me and everybody around us, just blew me through the air. While loss of the bridge stopped the tanks, it didn't stop the North Vietnamese infantry. They began to surround us from the flank. And finally, after about six days, we were down to 
roughly 300. Eventually, Ripley's outnumbered and outgunned Marine Battalion was forced to withdraw from Dong Ha. I remember the, the incredible firmness of... With American combat troops almost all gone by the middle of 1972, the North Vietnamese felt confident enough to come out of the jungles and fight a conventional war. They believed that American... But significant in the Easter Offensive, it was air power and it was not ground power. Launched on April 2nd by the 7th Fleet operating in the Gulf of Tonkin, Operation Linebacker was a massive air and naval bombardment aimed at stopping the advancing North Vietnamese. The targets were large troop concentration, armored concentrations, supply bases, anything that they could do to destroy. Waves of B-52s and Air Force fighter bombers joined Navy and Marine planes from carriers in the Gulf of Tonkin, bombing the North Vietnamese. The orders came from... Holloway allocated three of his six aircraft carriers for Operation Linebacker's bombing missions. Our job as a forward air controller will identify the targets and direct the heavier strike aircraft against those targets. Because OB-10s were slow and flew close to the ground, they were easy targets for enemy ground fire, and they were defenseless. In most cases, our ordnance that we carried were the, the 2.75 inch uh, smoke rockets designed specifically to hit the ground, explode, and put up a large puff of smoke. Marking targets for U.S. bombers was dangerous work. Despite the continuous air and naval bombardment, the North Vietnamese had managed to control most of the northern part of Quang Tri province, three weeks into the offensive. We're falling back on Quang Tri city. We have naval gunfire ships off the shore. It's the best we have. But the U.S. best wasn't good enough, at least not yet. Quang Tri city was in enemy range. And they begin to shell the capital of Guam, which caused massive panic when 25,000 people hit the road. The road was filled with vehicles, cars, oxes, children. Quickly, the North Vietnamese moved to cut off escape routes from Quang Tri City. We heard an enormous explosion, a mushroom-shaped cloud rising up from the road. And a bus full of refugees had run over the road. And by the time we got to the road, it was extremely The dead, we almost dead. A lot of people were shot. but they can only take so much. On May 1st, the Arvin general in charge ordered his troops to abandon Quan Tri City. Evacuate to the south, uh, down along Highway 1, to another river about 12 kilometers south of 
There at the Michan River, the South Vietnamese finally were able to set up a defensive line that stopped the North Vietnamese.
been fighting like this all yesterday and today, and they'll be fighting like it all tomorrow. A fight in the way it used to be done early in 67 and 68. Fights for a hill, as the Americans fought for Hill 44 and 50. Quan Tri is about 10 miles up the road, but they'll continue fighting like this because the communists, the communists hold the road between here and the town. This is the Battle of Quan Tri. Michael Nicholson, news at 10, on the road to Quan Tri, South Vietnam. American air support for the South Vietnamese Army, codenamed Operation Freedom Train, had unleashed tens of thousands of airstrikes against the attacking northern troops and their supply lines. Massive American firepower, including the heavy guns of warships offshore, made certain the northern divisions could advance no further. The South Vietnamese held the North Vietnamese at bay for two months at the Mi Chon River in Quang Tri Province. And after five days of intense American naval and air bombardment, 10,000 South Vietnamese Marines, joined by their American advisors, stormed across the Mi Chan River. Yes. Moved fairly well, moved fairly rapidly.
Congress, to use an old GI expression, been wasted. The devastation began shortly before the North Vietnamese seized the city May 1st. The South Vietnamese counteroffensive, beginning July 19th, continued the dismantling of the provincial capital at a great loss of military hardware and human life. Casualties among the Marine Corps, which fought the final phase, numbered 1,500, with 10 times that number of North Vietnamese estimated killed or wounded. But by Friday, the Marines on top of the wall of the Citadel felt victory was in sight. Two battalions of Marines were in occupation of about half of the Citadel's 50 acres. There were no big weapons inside. This was an infantry fight. Troops fired rockets at bunkers occupied by their enemy. These bunkers had originally been built by the South Vietnamese 3rd Division, whose route precipitated the loss of Quang Tri in the first place. By now, only around 100 North Vietnamese were left inside the Citadel, according to intelligence estimates. As these incoming rounds demonstrated, however, they were still supported by artillery in the surrounding areas. This artillery will pose a serious problem for the South Vietnamese if they try to maintain large numbers of troops in the Quang Tri ruins.
North Vietnamese soldier captured during this offensive was not as experienced as those captured in the past. But he brought a lot more equipment and ammunition and some new weapons. These were typical of prisoners captured recently. Most were between 18 and 24 years old. A few out of training and had seen their first combat. They seemed to know little of the larger objectives of the offensive. It appeared this time Hanoi had sent south all the soldiers it could afford. In this offensive, the North Vietnamese were better armed than ever before. They brought about 200 Russian-made tanks into South Vietnam, which spearheaded attacks on every major front. These are the shells fired by the tanks, 100 millimeters, three feet long, more than 50 pounds each. Chinese-made weapons the North Vietnamese had used for a long time, but this time they had a lot more of them. The North Vietnamese brought all these weapons a long way over bad roads without much transportation. Considering that, perhaps the most notable fact is how much equipment they have. Jack Paxton, NBC News, South Vietnam. Vietnamese 175 millimeter guns pointed their barrels to a pine tree city and opened fire. What appears to be the definitive South Vietnamese drive to reoccupy the ruined capital of this country's northernmost province is underway. The smoke over Quang Tri's central fortress, the Citadel, was caused by airstrikes and artillery. Supported by tanks, South Vietnamese Marines entered the Citadel Sunday. We could hear the fighting even if we could not see it. The Marines banned reporters from accompanying the operation inside the Citadel. South Vietnamese forces have taken severe casualties in the two months of fighting for this city, which is now militarily meaningless. The Marines apparently want to avoid publicizing the losses they still must take in the fight for Central Quang Tri City. expression been wasted. The devastation began shortly before the North Vietnamese seized the city May 1st. The South Vietnamese counteroffensive, beginning July 19th, continued the dismantling of the provincial capital at a great loss of military hardware and human life. Casualties among the Marine Corps, which fought the final phase, numbered 1,500, with 10 times that number of North Vietnamese estimated killed or wounded. But by Friday, the Marines on top of the wall of the Citadel felt victory was in sight. 
Two battalions of Marines were in occupation of about half of the Citadel's 50 acres. There were no big weapons inside. This was an infantry fight. Troops fired rockets at bunkers occupied by their enemy. These bunkers had originally been built by the South Vietnamese 3rd Division, whose route precipitated the loss of Quang Tri in the first place. By now, only around 100 North Vietnamese were left inside the Citadel, according to intelligence estimates. As these incoming rounds demonstrated, however, they were still supported by artillery in the surrounding hills. This artillery will pose a serious problem for the South Vietnamese if they try to maintain large numbers of troops in the Quang Tri ruins.
rồi 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 được chúng lại chúng lại chúng lại
xuống này chơi hả We moved down this morning. Uh, we took some mortars and uh, rockets, but uh, they pressed a strong attack to the south. They came down real good. They were spread out. Uh, they took some casualties, but uh, they kept going. And we pushed through the burnout convoy and uh, linked up with the people that were pushing north to meet us. And, uh but had a fight every day. Every fight ended in significant incoming artillery. All of us did. We took a lot of casualties from artillery and mortars, but artillery especially.
Flying in support of the South Vietnamese offensive was almost every aircraft the U.S. had in theater, including huge B-52 bombers flown by men like Captain. In the summer of 1972, Zul was bombing the North Vietnamese in Quang Tri province. The targets would change day by day based upon both the intelligence assessments as well as the forward air controllers who were constantly over the battlefield. It was airstrike. That marked targets for the B-52s. We sometimes became perhaps callous, perhaps cavalier. But even with the help of the forward air controllers and the B-52s, it took the South Vietnamese most of July to push the North Vietnamese back. The offensive took five to get back to the outskirts of Quang Tri City. When the South Vietnamese reached the outskirts of the provincial capital of Quang Tri City on July 27th, their American advisors called in even more firepower. It was about a with everything we had, artillery, air, it was reduced essentially to a pile of rubble. But when the South Vietnamese entered the city of 17,000 residents, they discovered that the North had dug in and was putting up stiff resistance. The North Vietnamese, and we'd hold the other side of that same street. Both sides used grenades, very extensive. Right in that city where it's just a continuous sound of grenades going off. They held us at that street, officially, for five or six days. Two companies of South Vietnamese Marines finally made it across the street, but at a heavy price. But it was a lot. 50% in those two companies. Once across the street, the Marines began moving cautiously through the city, one street at a time. Their ultimate objective, the ancient walled fortress of the Citadel at the center of the city. You make progress for 50 or 75 yards until you hit the next street. The Vietnamese Marines were tremendous little fighters. They did not need my advice on how to fight. By August 3rd, the South Vietnamese had fought their way to the Citadel. They took over the remains of a three-story hotel a hundred yards from the Citadel wall to use as an observation post. I spent day and night fighting in Quang Tri City in that observation post sticking up there. I was coordinating all the air for all of the battalions that were kind of converging on that point. Despite the pounding they were taking from the air, the North Vietnamese had had almost two months to dig into the Citadel. They defended it ferociously for the rest of August and into September. Because despite all, so the South Vietnamese Marines could get in. And if you ask a pilot to go around and come at the wall from the opposite direction, then he was flying right into you. And if he missed, you had it. So with laser-guided bombs, these are 2,000-pound bombs now, and slam a hole in one of the walls of that citadel. What really turned the tide? I can see that explosion to this day. The bombs on September 15th blew a hole big enough for the South Vietnamese to get through. And was it it? An event Smith will never forget. Nearly constant bitter fighting for those of us who were there when the offensive started and, and had survived it all. I think my... F Retaking the citadel and with it Quang Tri City seemed to take the heart out of the North Vietnamese Easter Offensive. By the end of October, they had been pushed back across the demilitarized zone. Get out!